Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church in Lindsay. Not only do we want to minister to the people who regularly attend Fairview, but we also want to minister to those who live within the city of Kortha Lakes with the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on in and, and join us for worship. It is our prayer that you'll be blessed. Do you like mysteries? Do you like reading those mystery novels and watching those movies that there's a puzzle that needs to be solved or code that needs to be figured out? The mystery. You know, one of my favorite movies is uh, National Treasure. How many of you have seen that one? Nicholas Cage, most of the youth have, okay. Um, you, 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 he's, he's Benjamin Franklin Gates, bit of a treasure hunter, professor who finds special clues in many of the American treasures, and you meet him out in the Arctic on, on the on the ship called the Charlotte that was stuck in the Arctic ice and he finds these little clues and then all of a sudden he's led on this wild goose chase. Realizes there's a special secret map on the back of the Declaration of Independence in the United States there and he devises an interesting scheme to steal it out of Washington, D.C. And, and where he ends up going on a wild goose chase, going to Pennsylvania, where the Independence Hall was. And, and in the midst of that, there's a pretty woman that he falls in love with, a little romance develops. But he finds these secret glasses, and the glasses show the secret things that are on the, the back of the Declaration of Independence. Eventually, they're led to New York City, and in New York City, they find a, the, the treasure in Trinity Church, it's underneath this secret tunnel, and we have a secret tunnel here at the church too. No, I'm joking, but <laughs> they find the secret tunnel, and in the secret tunnel, they, they go deep into the ground under New York City, and they find all these, this gold treasure. Unfortunately, it's all made up, but it makes a good movie. But we all like mysteries. And did you know that the Bible tells us about some mysteries and reveals some mysteries to us, some special secrets that are revealed only to certain people. We've been doing a series in the book of 1 Corinthians called Doing Life Together, and uh, we, we've been looking at this letter to this church at Corinth, this, this church that was a little bit dysfunctional. They had some struggles. And the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, writes this letter to the church that applies to us today. And he talks about some secrets. And he talks about some hidden mysteries that are in Christianity. And within this passage, he, he tells us that there are two mysteries that are mentioned. One that has been revealed, and one that hasn't quite yet been revealed. We're going to look at these two mysteries today. And, and so, uh, do we need mysteries revealed? I, I think when we understand these mysteries, it will help you with your walk with Christ. We, we all struggle with our faith at times. Wondering, should I stick with it? Is it worthwhile following after Christ? The temptations of the world just seem so attractive out there. Why don't I go after them instead of the things of Christ? And I think this passage will help you with your walk with him. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. And, and, and follow along as I read this. It says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they did, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen 
No ear has heard. No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man or the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man, the spiritual person, makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any of man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that some things have been revealed to us. And thank you how this passage reveals to us some mysteries And may you open our eyes to see what we need to see today as we look into your word. Would you guide me and allow me to express what your word teaches to these people? And and Lord, would you open our ears so that we can hear what we truly need to hear here? Bless us today as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, he, he's building on what we've looked at in the past. In fact, in the, in the chapters before, the verses before, he, he talks about this great wisdom. He talks about wisdom. He talks about scholarship. He talks about philosophy. And he, he talked about last week in, in the passage beforehand. He talks about how, how some people think wisdom's the answer to everything. Some people think being a good scholar is the wisdom to everything. Some people think if, if, if you have the right philosophy down... You can reason it, and, and you can find truth in those things. And, and he says, no, those three things can miss it totally, can miss the true wisdom that's only found in Jesus Christ. And so he expands on this, and, and he says, it's not like the wisdom of this age. He says, we do not, however, speak of a wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He says, we speak a different type of wisdom. Not the type of wisdom that the world pursues. It's very different than that. Not the same type of wisdom that the rulers pursue. Ours is different than that. This past Monday, some of you came here to the all-candidates meeting. We had four of the the different candidates running for uh, our local MP. It was a good night. It's a good night to hear from these, these people. All of them are good speakers. All of them seem to be good leaders. Uh, they expressed what, what they thought, how things should be run, and, and their party's position, and so on and so forth. It was a good time. But, um, but none of them expressed that they were following the wisdom of Jesus. None of them expressed that. Why didn't they express it? Because mainstream media would would, would mock them. Politicians would be mocked in this world if they said, hey, I'm following after Jesus. But the fact is, no matter what stripe gets in, no matter what party gets into power, it won't solve the issues in this world. It won't solve the issues within our country. We're still going to have crime We're still going to have financial challenges. We're still going to have injustices, and there's still going to be the poor. We're still going to have greedy people. We're still going to have corrupt people. And politics politics won't change that in this world. Now, good politics helps. But the fact is, the, the wisdom of Christ and a heart change from people And Christ changing that heart is the only thing that's going to change this world. And and this wisdom that the Apostle Paul speaks about here, he he says, it's there before time began. It it, it was there before time began. And he says this, he says, um, 
No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Jesus was there at the beginning of time. No one saw him, but Jesus was there. And he also said to the rulers of this age, uh, the Romans and, and, and the Jewish rulers uh, did not see it, did not know it, because if they did, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. And, 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 and that if they knew the mysterious plan of God, of Jesus Christ coming to this earth as a suffering servant, not with a sword, not with political power, if they understood this, they never would have crucified Jesus. The, the Romans and the Jews would never have put him on the cross. But you know what? That, that was God's plan all along. When, when, when Jesus was being put to the cross, the Father wasn't looking down saying, oh, no, oh, 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 what's going on here? It was his plan all along for his son to be crucified on the cross. Why? To take away our sins. Yet Jesus, when he was doing his ministry, as the gospel talks about how he was healing the sick and, and raising the dead, many times you could see him say, hey, shh, 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 shh. hey, 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 don't, don't go tell anybody. <laughs> I can see, I can see, I can see. You know, they're, they're, they're the person blind from birth telling the world, and Jesus says, shh, shh, don't tell anybody. Why did Jesus say, shh, don't, don't tell anybody? Partly because that wasn't the main reason why he came. Yeah, he was God. He, he could heal the sick and raise the dead. But the reason why he said, shh, shh, is because he had a secret ambition. And his ambition was to give his life for our sins. And, and so he says, the people of this way, world do not understand the secret wisdom. And he goes on, he says, however, as it is written, and he quotes Isaiah, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. He says, hey, this is what the mystery is. This mystery is something that we don't fully know. Part of it, it's Jesus Christ being revealed. That's part of the mystery. But we, we don't fully know this, what this whole mystery looks like because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Part of the mystery is unfolded in Jesus Christ. But as we follow after Jesus Christ, we have no idea what God has in store for us, especially for those who love him. God wants to take us places that we've never been before, to new heights. He says, to those who love him, to those who love him, to those who know him, to those who obey him, to those who follow him, to those who love him. We, we can easily tell what happens to people who rebel against him. Those people who, who go against his plan uh, we can easily predict what's going to happen to those people. If you go against his love, if you rebel, if you, if you live in sin, it's easy to predict what's going to happen. You'll, you'll have an unfulfilled life. You'll have a life without meaning. You, 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 you'll have heartbreak and hardship, and, 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 and your destination, your future destination is, is hopeless. And if you really rebel... If you really go hard against the things of God and you can do some harmful things, you can find yourself in addiction, you can find yourself with some really bad habits, eventually leading to jail, and maybe even death. And, and really, eventually all sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. And so he says to those who love him, do you love him? Are you obeying him? Are you following him? Are you seeing him do some neat things in your life? God wants to take us to places that are hidden. He wants us to take us to places that we can't see, that we can't dream of, because they're so great. And he wants to do that here on earth. He'll eventually do that for those who love him in, in all eternity. But he wants to do that here on earth, too. And what does God want to do through you? What does God want to do through our church 
And in fact, the Apostle Paul is addressing the church at Corinth. God wants to do something to you, to those who love him, to the group of believers. And what does he want to do through us? Who does he want us to reach with the gospel? What are the different partners that he wants us to strategically have as a church to, to, to share the gospel to the ends of the earth? What does he want to do to see change in us and be used to be part of the change? We have a purpose and a passion and a value statement for our church. And let me just go over the passion of our church. We came up with this last year, and we really feel that this is what we want to be about. This is our passion. This is what drives us. We want to be a catalyst for life change in the Quarthus and beyond for God's glory. We want to be used by God to see life change around us, to our neighbors, to our friends, to those who are hurting, to those who need Jesus. We want to see life change for God's glory. And, and so who is it that God is going to rise up in this, raise up in this church to be the next generation of leaders? among these people? What does God have in store for these people? <laughs> Who are the loud people that he's going to use in this church? Who are the quiet people he's going to use in this church? You know, this morning you heard about how the elders have put forward an aggressive financial goal. And it's pretty aggressive, especially when we're in a deficit position. How in the world are we going to come up with these funds? As your pastor, I know what I can give. And I'm almost, at, I am at my max, but I'm, I'm going to be seeking with my family, okay, how else can we give a little bit more? And there are some people who could cover a substantial portion of what we're trying to raise. Maybe you're selling something. Maybe you had a gift someplace and you say, you know what, I, I can do that. But God wants us all to take part of this. There are some of you who, who need to start seeking God. And you're saying, yeah, I, I love God, but I don't love God with my money. <laughs> Do you love God with your money? Yes, you love God with your money. That's part of it. All of us like money. And, and the love of money is the root of all evil. We need to love God more than money. But do we use our money to glorify God? You give to your Hydro Bill, you give to your Bell or your Rogers or your Kojiko Bill. I'm wondering, do you give more to them than you give to God? You're more faithful at paying your tax, more faithful at paying your Hydro than you are faithful at giving to God. It's not about us giving equally. It's about all of us sacrificially, of sacrificing equally. It's not about all of us giving equally. It's all about us sacrificially, sacrificing equally. And we're talking about the people who love God. Do you show that you love God with everything? And, and so no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. What does God have prepared for us? What new things is he going to do? And I can tell you a few stories that I have been blown away with just a couple, in the past couple weeks of God just saying, watch this, watch this. Things I would never have it, I've imagined yet. And God's just doing that through our local church. And so let's pray about this and see what in a month from now, what God's going to surprise us with. So... So we're, we're told that this, this secret has been revealed, but we don't know all of it. The next thing is that we can see here is that the Spirit has revealed this mystery. He says, but God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit is the key that unlocks this mystery. It says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. In verse 11, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We're told that the Spirit searches, searches the deep things of God. And, 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 and he talks about, Paul talks about the Spirit. 
And, you know, the spirit in our day has been twisted quite a bit. Oh, you're a spiritual person. Oh, that's of the spirit. Well, what, what's that mean? And so much confusion occurs about the spirit's work and, and us being spiritual people. The fact is, all of us are spiritual. All of us are spiritual. The, the Bible uses spirit and soul interchangeably. Spirit and soul mean the same thing. All of us were created, we were given, when we were created, we were given a spirit. It wasn't there before we were created. It was given to us when we were knit in our mother's womb. That's when our soul came and it was created then. And we are all spiritual people. We're also physical people too. We have spirit and physical. Body and flesh and spirit. And all of us are spiritual whether we believe it or not. Our bodies will one day die, but our souls will live on for all eternity. But the question we need to ask ourselves, what does a spiritual person look like? What, what does one following out the Spirit of God look like? Some people will say, well, somebody who's spiritual, someone who's following with the Spirit of God, a good Christian spiritual person, is one who prays and, and does certain rituals often. You, you know, they, they, they might hum their prayers and, and they say these elaborate things, and, 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 and they, they do these rituals. Well, does that make them spiritual? Many think it's, it's about studying the Bible. I know the Bible inside and out. I, I know it from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, I can quote a, a verse on every other page of my Bible. Knowing your Bible, does that make you spiritual? I don't think so. Some people say, well, those people who are spiritual have the right answers. They're just so deep. They understand the deep spiritual truths. So they must be the spiritual person. Some people think, well, no, it's a certain act that you put on and you have to dress in white and kind of dance around and sing songs. And they're spiritual. A little bit odd. No, that's not it either. Some people think it's, it's, it's this interesting out-of-the-body experience that makes you spiritual. Maybe speaking in uttering these other tongues, these other languages, or, or having an experience at a certain church service or, or a meeting where you're slain in the spirit, or, or maybe you're healed in a spectacular way, or maybe God uses you in this, this amazing way. That is what makes you spiritual. Well, unfortunately, God can use anyone. In fact, God can use anything. In fact, in the Old Testament, we're told that he used a donkey to speak. And he used evil kings to do what was right. And, and it, is a donkey spiritual? No. Were, were the evil kings spiritual and filled with the Spirit of God? No. And just because God is using someone doesn't mean that they have the Spirit of God, too. And some also think that, well, being spiritual is, you know, it's just getting the spirit worked up in here. It's like this emotion. It's this good time. It's this fun time. And when, you know, when I was with those, that group of people, it was a spiritual time. Like I had fun and it was emotionally working me up. But emotions are not the spirit. The Apostle Paul explains the work of the spirit here tells us that the Spirit searches. The Holy Spirit, he, he, he knows the deep things of God. He knows the mysteries of God, and he reveals it to his people. Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, we're told. And he reveals it. And he uses this illustration. He, he gives us this picture. He says, who knows your thoughts? Who knows your thoughts? Do I know your thoughts? Let me think. No, nobody can read anybody else's mind, but our spirit knows our thoughts. Our th spirit knows the deepest parts of us, and it also knows our motives. And we're told that the Holy Spirit, in the same way, this third person of the Trinity, reveals us the thoughts of God. In verse 12, it goes on, it says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who, who, who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. 
This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing tr spiritual truths in the spiritual words. The Apostle Paul says, we, we here. And, 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 and the question is, who is the we here? We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Who is that we? Well, the we, he's talking about the apostles. The we, he's talking about those who, who wrote down the, the Scripture, the Bible. He says, we, who God has entrusted with this, we give you what the Spirit has, has taught us. Unfortunately, it's not you and I. We, we don't get the special revelation the way Paul did. And, and the Bible was written down for us, and the Spirit has given us the Word of God. And it's so important not to read the Bible just as any other book. The Spirit guided the writers, so it is from God. They didn't make this up on their own. The Bible is the Word of God because the Spirit of God guided the writers to write this stuff down. And it's been revealed to us. It's been revealed to believers now. And so it goes on, he says, the, the man or the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Here's part of the mystery being revealed. The person without the Spirit of God does not accept the things that come from God. The, the person without the Spirit thinks the things that come from God are foolishness. Why would I want to believe that? Why would I want to believe in the Jesus who died on the cross? It's kind of foolish. It happened so long ago. Why should I believe that? And, and so how do you know if the Spirit is in you? Well, we're able to discern, it says. If you're a follower of Christ, you, you can recognize and believe that Jesus is the Savior who came to die on the cross for your sins. And he has taken them away. He lives in you and he is doing a new work. And, and, and the Spirit lives in our lives. And, and the Spirit, he was there even before we came to Christ because he prompts us. But as we come to Christ, he dwells in us now. You see, to be a spiritual Christian... It's about having Christ in your life. To, to be a spiritual Christian, it's, it's not necessarily by doing things. It's, it's by receiving Christ. And as you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within you. But Pastor John, I, I received Christ and I didn't feel any different. Pastor John, when I received Christ, I, I, I didn't act strange. Pastor John, when I received Christ, I, 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 I didn't know the Bible any better. When you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit. And reading the Bible and praying and singing should, should help us grow spiritually. But just because it, we do it doesn't make it spiritual. Because Christ has to be in our lives. And the Holy Spirit comes in our lives when Christ comes in our lives. We're told that the Spirit helps us discern. Does the Spirit help us to read people's minds well? Does the Spirit give us an ability to, to, to make better decisions than other people? Should I go right or should I go left? Spirit, what do you want me to do? Is that what it's saying? No, that's not what this passage is saying. We're, we're able to discern if we're a child of God. And it goes on, it says, we're able to make a judgment. It says, the spiritual man or the spiritual person makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. It means that we're, 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 we're able to tell pretty quickly who's in and who's out and following after Christ. It doesn't make us, give us the authority to make judgments on people. You're a sinner, you're not. Let me judge you. No, that's not what it's saying here. It means that we just know who's in and who's out. For instance, why is it that I can go to Spain this summer and meet a person that I've never met before? 
And he's part of this local body of believers. And, and as he shares his testimony with me through the translator, I quickly realize he's a child of God. It's because the Spirit's given me that spirit of discernment. I, 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 wow, he's my brother. Why is it that I can go down to Haiti and, and, and meet some, some people who, who are uneducated, extremely poor, but th th they're children of God and they just share their story with me and I, I can quickly know, no, they're, they're followers of Christ. They understand the mysteries. They have the Spirit of God within them because God, the Spirit's given me the spirit of discernment. A person with the Spirit can discern by getting to know a person and, and seeing and hearing about how Christ has come into their lives. Can we be deceived? Sure we can. The Bible talks about how, 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 um, how, how there are wolves in sheep's clothing. People infiltrate the church who, who act like they're believers, but truly they don't have the Spirit of God within them. In his book, who Stole My Church, the writer Gordon MacDonald tells a story about a church member who was really struggling with the changes that were going on in that church. He was, a, a number of, he was one of a number of older people within that congregation who were part of that church for years. And most of the older people over time realized that change needed to occur in order for more people to come to Christ and more people to grow in Christ. It wasn't about the method that mattered it was about the message. It wasn't about the, the function. Um, it wasn't about the form, but it was about the function, the reason for the program. But this one member, his name was John, and he was opposing every change. And he was extremely vocal about the change, speaking out. And eventually he left the church and he said, I'm going home and I'm just going to watch my church programs on TV because I can't put up with this anymore. And the pastor, saddened and hurt by these events, wondered how a person who said he was a follower of Christ could, could leave the church in such a huff and leave his fellowship of believers behind. Let me read it from you out of his book. It says, The next morning at the church office, I went through the membership files until I found John's church membership application. It had been filled out about 25 years ago. On the first page were usual spaces for name, address, phone number, and birth date. Then on the second page were several questions, the first of which was, when did you become a Christian and what were the circumstances? John had written 1956 high school retreat, prayed with the speaker to receive Christ. John had been baptized several years later, and as I pieced the dates together, it looked as though he had joined the church about the time he and Whitney had been married. Thus, the baptism, because a church required it, of all church members. Uh, did these small details suggest that John's church life was driven by his desire to please or win Whitney and satisfy any questions she had about the wisdom of them getting married? The elder who had interviewed John for church membership had a brief notation on the back of the application. I like John. I'm not sure that John fully, and he underlined fully, understands what it means to be a Christian. He said all the right words, but I don't know if they truly come from the heart or if he's simply trying to pass the test. There was a further notation with a signature of the pastor at that time uh, that John was baptized on that Easter evening. I put the membership application back into the file folder and went to my desk I wonder if there was a connection between the elder's suspicion and what I had seen in John's conduct 30 years later. Do you have the Spirit of God working in you? Has the Spirit confirmed that within you? Do you understand the message of Jesus Christ and is he living in you? Paul breaks out quoting Isaiah. He says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? What does he quote this? Well, it says, it means when God's spirit is in the believer, who really can instruct that person on spiritual matters? When God's spirit is within that believer, who can really instruct that person on spiritual matters? 
Can the government instruct a person on spiritual matters? Can secular teachers instruct a person on spiritual matters? Can highly educated people instruct a person on spiritual matters? Can wealthy people instruct people on spiritual matters? No, only God can. And that's who we take our cues from, God. And the Spirit of God has given us his word, so we're going to follow after his word. And the Spirit of God helps us to understand and apply the word. And so he ends this chapter and he says, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. You see, the second secret that's, that's, that's revealed here, and that's frozen up, uh, is revealed by the Spirit. Christ is the salvation of our souls, and we have access to the Father. Christ is the salvation of our souls, and we have access to the Father because of what the Spirit has done in our lives. That's the great truth we get from this passage. That is the mystery, and not everyone sees this. Well, Pastor John, I knew this way back when. Yeah, even children can know this. But some just can't accept it. Some can't let it resonate within their heart, within their being. And so some of you have been doubting your faith. Am I a true believer? Well, do you know the mystery? Have you accepted the mystery that Christ came to, to save you from your sins? And he's living in you. Do you have the spirit living in you? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? Has taken them away as he did on the cross? Are you letting him live through you? Have you discovered the gift of discernment? Do you know others who are believers? Maybe some people that you meet at work and, and, and it seems like, okay, there's something different about that person. As you get to know them, they share their story with you. You say, hey, that's a brother or sister in Christ. You go to the other side of the world and you go to a church there and you, you resonate with these other believers. It's confirmation of your faith. But I don't feel it, Pastor John. Well, the Spirit is not a feeling. Faith is not a feeling, per se. It's trusting in truth. And right now, we don't see all the truth, but we believe it. That's what faith's about. And so because the Spirit has revealed us in us, it, it should encourage us even more. And because of this, I think we need to say no to the things of the world Quit going after them and follow after the things of Christ to see what new heights he's going to take us to. See what new mysteries he has in store for us. Because we keep our eyes on him. Can I encourage you just to bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I, I, I just don't get this. Maybe you think church is about being a good person. You're surrounded by a really group of good, nice people. And you think that's, that's what it's all about. Church is really so much more. We come together to worship Jesus Christ. And maybe you've heard that message of Jesus Christ, and, but you haven't responded to his love, to his prompting. You haven't given your life over to him. Well, today's the day to do that. And all you need to do is agree with him and accept him into your life. Realizing that he died on the cross for your sins and putting your faith and trust in him. And you can express that through a prayer. And if you want to repeat this prayer after me, you can do that. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Please come in and take away my sins. Here's my life. I want to follow after you. Come live in me. Lead me. If you said a prayer and you mean that from your heart, Christ will come in and do a transforming work and the spirit will come and reside in you. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, I encourage you to talk to me or talk to a friend that you've come with. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work that you do in people's hearts and lives, how you, how you change people. 
I thank you for these secrets that have been revealed to us. That you have come to save us from our sins. Lord, for those who still don't understand, I pray that you would take the scales off their eyes. You would open the eyes of their hearts so that they can see you, Lord. And for those of us who are struggling in our faith, I pray that this will just be affirmation once again, saying, I need you every hour. I need you in my life, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what we've heard today. In Jesus' name, amen. It is our desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.